devastation. In this one moment, it's just almost incomprehensible that they can exist right now. So, and we are grateful. So close. Trigger warning: This podcast is intended for men, not boys, not babies, men. This is how we disable toxic masculinity. We need to kill all men. This pagan patriarchalism that is coming back out of the shadows. Feminists hate patriarchy. It's the woman that runs the show, and the woman that runs the community and is the backbone of, of that area. I'm a nasty woman. A loud, vulgar, proud woman. Patriarchy. patriarchy. You are male privilege. Are you saying you have authority over me? Go eat your superior! I personally can't see why egalitarianism would be a bad thing. The assumption that wives should make babies instead of money is part of the patriarchy. Don't f***ing say hi to strange women you don't know. Patriarchy. The patriarchy. 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 Righteous man who walks in his integrity, how blessed are his sons after him. And that is Proverbs chapter 20, verse 7. You are on the Fight, Laugh, Feast network, and you are listening to the Patriarchy. My name is Tony DePani, and I am joined by my co-host, Pastor Joseph Randall Spurgeon. Woman, get back in here and make me a sandwich. Joseph, what kind of sandwich are you eating today? Well, um, six cups of mixed lettuce leaves, uh, six ounces of fresh goat cheese, two ripe avocados, a little bit of uh, cucumber, uh, some sprouts, and some whole milk uh, Greek Greek yogurt, and a little bit of uh, tofu uh, placed on top of that. Tofu? Yeah. Well, it you know, meat substitute. What happened to you? That's the most. What do you mean? What happened to me? That's the most girly sandwich I've ever heard of. Like, are you, it's like what? You, what? That's dude. Cool. I'm I'm done. I'm done with this, man. This this segment, Tony, is so toxic. Uh, you think all men do is eat sandwiches, and I'm less of a man for not eating your cold, emotionless meat sandwich. Are Are you trying to stifle my feelings? Yes, <laughs> I am. I would take those feelings out back and bury them in the backyard and get my friend back. <laughs> this is the saddest thing I've ever heard. Before you know it, I'll, I'll, I'll become violent and, and tear people up because of your stupid meat sandwiches. Because of my meat sandwiches. You're, you're, because, I, because I shamed you? Is that why? Because I, because I shamed you for being a little girly man and eating your little girly sandwich? <laughs> Well, I'll have you know um, that I actually didn't eat any of that. Um, My wife fixed me a steak, so take that. There we go. Thank you. That's that's my co-host, and that's that's the friend that I know. That makes me feel better. I'm not going to have to not to have to find another another host of the the patriarchy, and and you didn't leave us to go to the matriarchy. You can bring Todd on over here. No, I'm not bringing Todd or Leonard over here. They could, they could stay on their, their little, uh, their little stupid little girly podcast they've got over at the uh, the Church of Jesus Loves You So Much. Well, I don't have a sandwich. Uh, I just have a uh, nice grilled chicken breast, and uh, it's meat. It's grilled. It may not be a sandwich, but hey, it's dead meat. That was grilled outside. That's manly. I'm good with that. And and you were giving me all that grief for not having a sandwich. I was giving you grief for not having a sandwich. I was giving you grief for the tofu and the weird little greens and all the you know sprinkled pixie yeah. dust you put on it or whatever that was. <laughs> You're part of the toxic uh, patriarchy, the toxic masculinity. I know that. Yeah, I am. I am part of the patriarchy. And if you'd like to support the patriarchy, go to fightlefteast.com and sign up for the code patriarchy. 
Yeah, and where can you, like, I'm always struggling with this, Tony. Um, like, I want to listen to your episodes, but every time I type in the patriarchy into uh, um, iTunes, something weird comes up. Well, if you'd like to find our episodes, good that you asked, Spurgeon. I wonder why you asked. But good that you asked. If you'd like to find our episode, if you go onto iTunes and you search for the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, and you subscribe to that feed, and you look under the feed for episodes starting with The Patriarchy Podcast every Tuesday, that's where you can listen to us. Or you can listen to us on Facebook Live at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, or you can listen to us on YouTube the day after. I feel like I just did a bunch of ads right there. (laughs) Sounds good. All right, so... Now that we've uh, totally uh, advertised the show, and uh, let's move on to everybody's favorite segment. Feminism ruins everything. My name's Jordan Stevens, and I'd like to talk about toxic masculinity. The idea of being a man, this idea of what a man is, I think is incredibly flawed. I grew up in a world where I would have role models like James Bond, a womanizing murderer who has basically spent 27 films running away from his childhood trauma. When there's an idea that you're supposed to be strong all the time, or that it's weak to cry, or that it's weak to appear vulnerable, I think that's incredibly destructive. I know that a lot of men around me haven't had easy upbringings, haven't had easy childhoods. Sometimes you just want like a hug, sometimes you just want someone to hear what you've been through. There is a male crisis at the moment because a lot of young men are killing themselves, unable to access their emotions because they feel that if they do, they'll be seen as weak. It's okay to be sad, man. Like, it's okay to be sensitive. Men have not been allowing themselves the space to feel pain as it comes. You've got to find safe environments in order to work for your pain. Talking with friends, for example, do you know what I mean? We live in an environment where I don't think it's particularly desirable for men to sit around and talk about how sad they feel about everything. But it's incredibly important because that sadness manifests. And if it isn't dealt with, if you don't take it upon yourself to heal yourself before entering into another person's space, then it can end with things like abuse and assault. How many of the men out there could cry in public and not feel self-conscious? How many people could sit down and be like, yo, I feel angry at my parents, I feel sad about my best friend doing this, I feel sad about society treating me like that. Like, it's cool. Trust yourself, be kind to yourself, love yourself. Everybody deserves to be loved, especially by themselves. Okay, let's unpack that one. Well, uh, man, where did we... Uh, let's start at James Bond. Yeah, right. Uh. Did, did you know that James Bond, like, how many... Uh, there, it was. It's all a bunch of movies about him running from his childhood. Apparently. I, I don't remember that origin story, but yeah, apparently. And, and that he's a mass murderer? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I lo- thought he was just a cool dude with some, like, gadgets. I love the fact that he's like, oh, you should look up the James Bond, but he knows the exact amount of films he's made. <laughs> Well, it, the whole thing is just like you feel like Debbie Downer after this whole you listen to this like, man, my life must be terrible. And because I'm not crying about it, I'm like toxic. Well, yeah, because you should be apparently out in public crying and not be ashamed by that. It, and it's I, somehow that's supposed to make society feel better that a bunch of the men that are supposed to be (laughs) the protectors and leaders of society are are instead supposed to be out in public crying about all the problems in the world unashamedly and i somehow that's supposed to make everybody feel better i i wouldn't feel better i'd feel i'd i'd think the end has come (laughs) (laughs) like could you imagine everybody you you, could you imagine you, you turn on Fox News, because we're all good conservatives, right? And or CNN, whatever. You turn on the news, and and they show you Congress, and and it's you know it's nothing but just a bunch of the male Congress you know uh, representatives or senators, and they're all just sitting around just weeping and crying, and then you're supposed to go, well, these are our good leaders. Everything's gonna be fine because there's a bunch of men crying on TV right now. Like I would not feel good or secure if I saw all of our nation's leaders just crying about all the problems. 
And listen, this, this Tony, what you're not saying is that a man never sheds a tear. Right. A man never cries. Right. You know, John Wayne cried. Uh, I think it was John Wayne cried over the tomb of 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 an old cowboy <laughs> when he died. So if, if he could shed a tear, we could shed a tear. Sure. But no, seriously, uh, a masculinity it does involve knowing and our feelings. I, I've never heard of anybody teaching uh, men not to uh, be able to identify how they're thinking and feeling. But it's important for men to be able to. Uh, fuel our emotions and our feelings not to be uh, into good to fuel them into good uh, places and not to be ruled by your passions. So, you know, Tony, men are to be self-controlled. Uh, we control our emotions because we have a mission. We have a mission to, uh, to build, fight, protect, and lead. Um, but I, 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 I saw earlier how even saying those things is considered part of the problem of toxic masculinity, expecting men to fit these rigid, so rigid that men are supposed to protect, build, fight, and lead. And um, the whole thing comes down to, uh, we just think men are defective women or boys are defective girls. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's not true. God created male and female. He created them distinct. And, you know, the scriptures say that we are to to act like men to stand firm to be bold and and it equates uh, a man um, being ruled by his emotions and passions uh with uh, an effeminate man or a man being uh like a woman a coward um it doesn't mean we don't express our feelings uh, you think of some of the manliest men in scripture uh king david he he writes all these psalms where he pours out his heart, but he doesn't pour out his heart just to like everybody on every little thing. He's pouring out his heart to God. Mm-hmm. And he weeps. Men can weep. You, you talked about Congress. Uh, um, it'd be weird if Congress was weeping. Actually, it depends on what they were weeping about. That's, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. If they, if, weep if for they the were right broken... Things. Yeah, if they were broken over the sin of this country yeah, and over their true. sin. Uh, that should cause us all to weep. But it's not about having just an emotional let letting go and, and that kind of thing. Our our God gave us feelings. He gave us emotions, and He gave them to men. But He expects us to be controlled and to use our passions to glorify and honor Him. Therefore, uh, when we are angry. We're to be angry and not sin. When we are uh, um, feeling anxious, we are to pray without ceasing, to pray with thanksgiving, make our requests known to him. Um, And then the peace of God will uh, be in our hearts. The peace passes understanding. So uh, this whole idea of toxic masculinity, um, it's, it's, it's really stupid. Well, and when I when I say to my boys, you know, uh, man up or you know don't cry, I'm not saying that you know like you were saying we're not saying that men never cry or boys never cry. But what we're trying to say is that there there is a there's a time and a place for that as well. And and what I was saying with Congress, although you made a very good point there, it would be nice if they actually wept over uh, the sin and idolatry of our country. Um, but you know they had normal government problems uh, like like there was a invading nation, right? <laughs> Coming to attack our nation, which is what the federal government's supposed to uh, do, protect the borders. Uh, and they instead all gathered together and huddled in the room and decided they were just going to start crying. That's not the proper time and a place, you know, to, to cry. And so for, for my boys raising them, um, you know, crying over literally at times, I'm sure you can identify with uh, this having similar aged boys, literally crying over at times, maybe like spilled milk or they dropped their favorite cookie or something, you know, that's not the appropriate time and place to cry over something. And, and we're trying to teach them, uh, to be tough when they need to be tough. And, and then yes, they can be, uh, broken or vulnerable when, when it's appropriate to do so. Yeah. And, and Tony, as, as we, you're, you're mentioning your sons and we think about raising sons in this kind of 
a world where masculinity is kind of looked down upon. Um, we are in obviously in this Me Too movement time period. It can be a, a kind of a crazy time to try to raise uh, raise sons, and yet uh, as fathers, we have been called to this task, and so we don't throw our hands up and cry about it either. You know, our culture seems overran with feminism, and many men want to just uh, you know go their own way. They want to, to cower. Uh, and and or just complain mm -hmm. and grumble about it all the time but uh that's toxic what needs to be done is is a man taking action and that action can begin with raising your sons to be godly men who are resourceful have strength seek justice they have determination they have grit and they can fight well and that's the problem i saw in that video right that he said that the issue was that adult grown men uh, can't weep in public and not be ashamed and that they have no place to do that. I except what he's failing to realize is it's because we allowed them as boys to just weep uncontrollably and be emotional all the time and never be able to control that and never be able to find where the proper time and place is for that. And so when they do actually get out of the real world where it's not appropriate to do that all the time, they can't handle it. Mm. Yeah. Having said that, since we're talking about the subject of raising sons in the toxic masculinity Me Too era, we thought it'd be a good idea to talk to a man, a wiser man, about that very subject. So, we are going to take a break, and when we come back, we are going to be on the line with none other than Pastor Doug Wilson. So stick around. You're on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, and you are listening to The Patriarchy. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Karen Rachel. I'm Rachel Karen. And I'm Chris. And, and together, together we are Hermeneutics. It's the brand new podcast just for women. Yeah, for gals like us who love theology. We will cover all kinds of topics related to theology, history, philosophy, ethics, and theology. From the unique perspective of women. Yeah, from gals like us who love theology. In each episode, we will work to apply the TNIV to the unique circumstances we women find ourselves in. We will talk about how Romans 13 applies to my calling as a woman in politics. Or how I apply the Titus 2 principles to my job in the military. Or how churches can involve more gals like me on the leadership council. Find out things you can do as a necessary ally to your servant leader husband to help him be a better servant leader. Oh, I just love my servant leader husband. You know, I like to make little lists for him when he gets home from work so he can know all the ways he can servant lead for me. It really helps him be busy leading. For those of us not trapped, I mean, uh, not blessed in marriage, you can learn about all of the joys of building a career as a conference speaker. Remember, heterosexuality isn't godliness. On Hermeneutics, we will help you break out of the wicked hold of the pagan Victorian patriarchy and into the mold of righteous Victorian feminism. You know, like the first wave of feminism led by great godly women like Unitarian Susan B. Anthony, twice divorced Carrie A. Nation, and Margaret Sanger before she was evil. All gals like us who love theology. So join us as we study the Word of God, asking the age-old question, Hath God really said... And help us put the her back in hermeneutics. We are on the line with Pastor Doug Wilson. Doug is the pastor of Christ Church in Moscow, Idaho, author of several books, including Father Hunger, Future Men, and Why Children Matter. He's the writer at Blog and Mayblog and the founder of Canon Press. 
He's been married to his wife, Nancy Wilson, for over 40 years, and together they have three children, one of whom is a best-selling author, and 17 grandchildren. Doug, welcome to the patriarchy. Well, thank you for having me. Good to be with you. Well, uh, Pastor Doug, I've been looking forward to having you on the show for a while, and we're kind of excited to pick your brain for some biblical wisdom. But before we do that, I I need to do my due diligence to make sure uh, we here at the Patriarchy podcast are safe. Uh, Therefore, um, (laughs) do you know if federal vision is contagious and can it be transmitted over the phone? (laughs) (laughs) After after 1,000 miles, no. Okay. Okay. But while we're on the subject, is this the patriarchy that I keep hearing needs to be smashed? We we would be part of that. Yeah, we would probably be part of that. You know, I, I understand why you want to be safe, right? But yeah. If everybody's after you, everybody's after you. For yeah. Sure, we have to screen every, all of our callers. <laughs> right. I don't know how you you got through, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> well. So thank you for being on the show. Uh, what we wanted to do today was talk about uh, raising godly and wise sons. Uh, we live in a time when, uh, obviously, as we were just talking about, masculinity is despised. Boys are kind of seen as defective girls. Uh, um, some research shows that boys are almost twice as likely to receive special education and three times more likely to be diagnosed with ADHD for what was once considered mm-hmm. normal boy behavior and In fact, worst of all, that the church is being polluted with the garbage water of the Me Too movement and intersectionality. So you Mm -hmm. wrote you wrote in uh, Future Men that faith conquers kingdoms, faith stops the mountains of lions, faith turns armies to flight, and faith brings boys up to mature and godly masculinity. So before we even get into any kind of how to questions. It might be helpful for you to kind of lay out for us a foundation of promises that our fathers need to grab onto. Could you can you kind of lay that foundation out for us, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, one of the things you want to avoid, and do your level best to avoid at all costs, is the notion of works-based parenting, um, as though as though you're getting good kids out of a vending machine, and if you and if you only put these this number of quarters in, you're going to get your doctor, lawyer, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's basically, that's the way um, upper middle class respectability works, but it's not how covenant parent parenting works. Uh, thinking covenantally parenting in terms of the covenant parenting in terms of God's promises is always a response to the promises of God. Um, and of course, when you hear the promise of God and you respond to it, you're doing something, but it's not, it's not the doing that is efficacious at all. It's the, it's the faith that is efficacious. And so if, if, uh, you were to ask most parents, is there any promise in the Bible about how your, um, how your kids, that your kids are going to turn out, um, probably the only one that people would might be able to come up with is uh, Proverbs where it says, train up a child the way he should go when he's old, yeah. he will not depart from it. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. that, and that promise is pr- probably talking about vocational training, you know, uh, cutting mm-hmm. with the grain if your kid's going to be a machinist or if he's going to be a, uh, a librarian or if he's going to, you know, whatever he's going to be, uh, cut with the grain when you're bringing the child up. But so the the one verse that everybody knows is is possibly uh, being misapplied to that. I would prefer to look at the promises of God uh, throughout the Old Testament with regard to generations. So if you look particularly at Deuteronomy five, where the uh, Ten Commandments are repeated, so the Ten Commandments are given in Exodus twenty and then uh, are repeated in, in Deuteronomy 5. And the, the Lord visits iniquity to three and four generations of those who hate him, but to thousands who love him. Well, thousands of what? Well, three and four generations of those who hate him to thousands of generations of those who love him. And then a couple chapters later in Deuteronomy 7, the word generations is... Uh, made explicit. It's stated there that God 
God blesses his people through a thousand generations. Um, now, the thing that there, there's a intertestamental issue here, that, and that's the Psalm 102 is the same sort of thing. Psalm 103, uh, where the, our Lord's mother uh, quotes Psalm 103 in her Magnificat. Um, and this and that that quotation of Psalm 103 is a key to understanding um, something about this. If you were to read carefully from Genesis to Malachi, looking for thousands of generations, you know, one, hundreds of generations following after hundreds of generations of faithfulness, you would be um, stumped. <laughs> it's just not there in the Old Testament, <laughs> yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, you turn the page and the people are, you know, dancing around the golden calf again. And then you, you turn the, <laughs> right. the, the page, and then they cry out because they're in trouble and God delivers them and you turn the page and they're back in idolatry. And it, it just seems to be this recurring cycle of, of rebellion, disobedience, uh, chastisement, repentance, deliverance. Okay. And that happens all the way through the Old Testament. Well, the New Testament is not the place where God comes down and abrogates it, and he doesn't come down and say something like, well, that didn't work. Um, <laughs> the, New Testament, uh, the New Testament is not the place where God abrogates his promises. It's the place where he, we see the divine intention to fulfill all of them in Christ. Okay, so Mary was not carrying in her womb the cancellation of all God's promises concerning bringing up godly children. Mm -hmm. She was bringing, she was carrying in her womb the fulfillment of all God's promises right. concerning this. And, and so the way I, there's an important thing that uh, I want to uh, emphasize here. The catalyst is always evangelical faith, living faith, the kind of faith that God gives and the only kind of faith that God gives. So when God promises that our children um, will, um, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, to use the words of Joshua. Mm -hmm. When God requires elders to have children who are not wild and profligate, not wild and disobedient, um, in Titus 1 and in 1 Timothy 3, when, he, when this sort of thing is just assumed— how, do, how are we to respond to that? Well, I think it's comparable to um, the, the promises of answered prayer in Scripture. Every Christian has faith with regard to uh, faith as the instrument of justification, mm -hmm. by definition. Every Christian uh, has saving faith, again, by definition. But not every Christian gets all of his prayers answered, even though there are promises of answered prayer in the scripture where Jesus says, um, whatever you ask for in my name, believing you've received it, you will get it. Mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't happen to everybody. Uh, but some Christians are particularly blessed with faith, not saving faith, but, you know, the George Mueller kind of faith where mm -hmm. they just um, go into a situation expecting God to deliver him, and he, do, he do, just does. The catalyst there is faith along the way, faith that's part of your sanctification. It's not a justification issue, but it's, it's part of your sanctification issue, uh, part of the sanctification. If someone is praying for something and God gives them the faith for it, they, they know they have it. They, they just don't ask me how I know. I know, I know that God's going to answer this. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it ought to be like that with our children. So when a worried mom, you know, looking over the heads of her five-year-old, three-year-old, and one-year-old looks across the dinner table to her husband and says, honey, I love these kids so much. How do we know that they're going to love and serve God? It, he shouldn't answer with something like, because we're going to homeschool really hard, or <laughs> we're going to, or we're going to read big fat theology books around the dinner table, or we're going to, um, we're, we're going to, you know, pedal harder. Any kind of pedal harder answer is likely to go astray. I think what he ought to do, and when my wife and I had these conversations, it would be, uh, I would say things like, honey, we're just going to trust God. We're, and we're going to actively trust God uh, for 
uh, our children to grow up to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, for them to marry people who want to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ, and to have their children growing up to love and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and it's not by works. Now, when someone, look, someone uh, next door neighbor or someone who knows you might look from the side and might say, well, it sure looks like you're working hard. Yes, but you're not trusting in an atom of those works. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. That faith works, but that's not what makes faith work. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, that's kind of the problem today is kind of like we have, uh, if I, like you said, if I homeschool and I, you know, organic food and essential oils, all my children, they'll grow up and be godly people. Right. Yeah. Not a chance. That's, it's, that's just not how it works. It's, it's not, a, it's not a vending machine. It's a relationship with God uh, where you want to you want to come to God as your father as a as the kind of child you want your children to come to you as. So you're, you're talking about the vending machine and putting quarters in, you know, if you only put the right quarters in the right amount that somehow they'll they'll you know come out the vending machine just fine. Are, are there particular I was thinking because I have boys and I have one girl and three boys and two of my boys right now are in that stage where they're just crazy, you know, and, and that was actually something right. when I, when I said we were going to go into this interview with me, uh, you, my wife was like, please ask him, how do you handle insane boys? Um, and I, what I was thinking <laughs> <laughs> as if there's the magic number of quarters, right. To put in, but I was thinking through that and, and what are, what are actually some of like the bad quarters, uh, that maybe people put in thinking are good, but will actually end up producing the wrong result. Yeah, well, I, I, you just made me think of one of them, and that is, um, the this might not be as much of an encouragement to your wife as you might like, <laughs> but I think there's real, en uh -oh. <laughs> I think there's real encouragement. I think there's a real encouragement here. Um, boys being insane mm -hmm. is not a bug; it's a feature. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, in other words, uh, this is something I noticed <clears throat> amongst. Uh, a number of years ago at Logos school. Um, and, and it was sort of like the light came on for me. This was a few decades ago where uh, piety in boy, genuine piety in boys and genuine piety in girls looks very different. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, now my kids are, you know, uh, my son's in his forties now, and I've got, you know, I've got a bunch of, this was back when my kids were in high school and, uh, I, uh, in my son's class, there were, there was a pack of girls who, who were athletic and beautiful and smart and godly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, they were just a wonderful group of girls. They're the kind of girls. Oh, oh so-and-so. Uh, looked a little down this, this morning. Let's leave an encouraging note in her locker, uh, telling her we're going to pray for her. You know, that's there were those sorts of girls, mm -hmm. and they they appeared to have it all together. And they were the kind of girls that an institution like a, a, a like a Christian school would be naturally, instinctively proud of. Right? This uh, this is our these are our students. Okay, okay, right. uh, because. Piety in girls is institution friendly. Okay, um, uh, piety in boys is not institution friendly. Mm. <laughs> okay, now that doesn't mean it's institution hostile, mm -hmm. but it's it's not concerned about the the needs of the institution. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it, it just doesn't track that way. So uh, if uh, if a faculty member we're walking down the hall and he saw, he saw a girl leaving an encouraging note in her friend's locker. And he thought, Oh, what a, you know, I have to remember the, these girls are great. I'm, uh, we're going to have a meeting about faculty commendations coming up. And man, that was really nice. And then he walks a little further down the hall and he walks past a couple of boys. And one of the boys just knocks the other boy into the locker and says, you fathead. Okay. <laughs> and the teacher and the teacher moves on. Uh, it doesn't ever occur to him that the boy who knocked the other boy into the locker might have been rebuking his friend for taking a non-Christian girl out the night before. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, because it just doesn't present 
like an institution friendly thing, but it's concerned for God's law and God's standards and ethics. And so it, there's all sorts of um, optical illusions that are created, particularly for uh, institutions and people who like institutions like the family to run smoothly, as in wives and mothers. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, wives and mothers are interested in um, people not running with scissors and not too much horsing around in the living room before dinner and not, you know, they, they want things to be uh, orderly. And one of the things that a uh, dad needs to encourage his wife in is, look, it's really important that you have this desire for order and that you bring that desire to them because these boys need a mom. Right. They also, mm-hmm. point B, need a dad mm-hmm. to tell them to uh, step it up a notch. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. they, 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 they need a dad to uh, say that there's a lot of energy here that is the kind of energy that builds civilizations. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and you've got to preserve that. Mm-hmm. You've, now, it's got to be disciplined by the Holy Spirit. But it shouldn't be disciplined by the spirit of effeminacy. Basically, uh, boys need to get knocked down. Boys Mm -hmm. need to be bruised. They need to bleed a little bit. They need to be in situations where someone will treat them with less than perfect tenderness. They they just, um, that's something that they thrive under. Now, of course, I'm not saying that you, you could have some teacher who was being a bully or some older right. student is being a bully. Right. Uh, and uh, of course, boys can be mistreated to the level that they are crushed. So, right. That they're, they're knocked down and it's not a good thing, but a good football coach, a good disciplinarian at the school, a man who understands boys, a Marine drill instructor is, you know, um, oftentimes moms who could not, could not, prevail upon their sons to, to make their bed or to, you know, do the simplest of tasks are beyond astonished when that same boy joins the Marine Corps out of high school and glories in a drill (laughs) instructor two inches from his face, yelling at him that he's a maggot and he's descended (laughs) from maggots. (laughs) Right. Uh, Well, there's something, there's something about that that is food for the soul. It's, it's good. It's healthy. It, um, it's what, uh, Nassim Tlaib calls in his book, anti-fragile. It's, it's the recognition that boys need to be anti-fragile. They need to be. And what he means by that is, um, when pressures, blows, buffets, um, um, challenges, battles come at this kid, it makes him stronger. Mm-hmm. Okay. Fragile. Someone who's fragile is someone who just collapses right. in the, in, in the, in the face of this sort of threat. Um, a, some, uh, a boy can be robust in the sense of it doesn't affect him one way or the other, but someone who's anti-fragile is someone who thrives, who gains strength from this kind of, uh, from this kind of thing. And it, I think it's, um, that's where warriors come from. So, Doug, what are some practical ways, it, it, putting this into in the flesh, for uh, helping our sons take godly risk taking and not encouraging them to ungodly foolhardiness? How do you? What do you do? Yeah, um, you, what you want to do is, uh, you know, of course. At, and let me qualify this: it's a fallen world, and in a fallen world, boys can fall out of trees. And <laughs> and hurt themselves and hurt themselves to an extent that you didn't want at all. Right. Right. But it's important that um, that they take the risk of doing that sort of thing, because if you if you wrap your son up in cotton batting and prevent him from taking any risk at all, what you're doing is simply creating the kind of wounds that don't bleed on the outside. Mm hmm. Um, you are, you are inflicting massive amounts of internal bleeding. 
right? So yeah. uh, if it's, just, I mean, just plain old foolhardy. Um, so I've uh, a little story here. Nate, my son, uh, his oldest son is named Rory. And when Rory was a little, uh, just a toddler, I think, he was um, entertaining, uh, entertaining himself uh, by jumping off the couch. And and Nate was right there. And, and then Rory got up on the arm of the couch and wanted to do a somersault off the couch. Okay. And Nate said, no, I don't think, I don't think so. That would, that's a, you know, that's a bridge too far. <laughs> and, uh, and Rory said, but the hospital's right there. <laughs> they, 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 they live a block away from the hospital. And so the hospital's right there. A, it was good that Nate didn't let him do it. And B, it was good that he wanted to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. <laughs> both of those, both of these, those things are good. And so basically it's a cost benefit risk analysis sort of thing. Um, you say, Oh, okay. That's, uh, that's too risky. I think somebody might get killed here. Mm-hmm. Um, but somebody might get hurt. That's not an argument. So, somebody might get hurt doing absolutely anything. Sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, you could be go- driving to grandma's for Thanksgiving dinner and somebody might get hurt. Mm-hmm. So, so um, there there are the sorts of things that you need for your boys, I think, are fundamentally situations in which they're going to get hurt and they might get damaged and you want them to avoid the damage, but learn through the hurt. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to think through it, it, We, I think as men, especially the fathers that are listening, I think we definitely understand because we were boys once and mm-hmm. we do take risks. And I think we get that a bit more than maybe our wives do. And I know, I mean, Joseph has two daughters and three sons. I have one daughter and three sons. I, I, our kids are actually eerily similar. <laughs> our kids have met. It's right. really kind of <laughs> eerie in the way that they're that similar. But um, our daughters, all of our daughters, they have been pretty low maintenance at this point. Uh, they, I mean, not that they're perfect, but as far as them compared to the boys, just lower lower maintenance. And right. I think that one of the things that we're, we're seeing, both our wives too, is you know the boys push their moms, and I know that's somewhat natural. But how do we mm-hmm. how do we keep uh, our wives from being exasperated by our sons, and also the vice versa, keeping our sons from being exasperated by our wives? Yes. So one time when my son was a young boy, we were going through a stretch where there were there were these uh, challenges, and one evening I had a talk with him. And I said, uh, you know, son, you're having these difficulties with your mom. Is that right? Yeah, Yeah, that's right, dad. And I said, is part of the problem that you don't want to do what she says because she's a girl. (laughs) Right. Um, Right. I'm a man. I'm a male. I don't want to take orders from a girl. Well, it says in Proverbs, my son, remember the law of your mother. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, so young boys are supposed to be under the authority of a female, at least for part of their um, upbringing. And, and when they're grown men, they, they need to remember that law and they need to understand that this is a design feature from God. OK, my son, remember the law of your mother. But what I told what I told Nate at that time, I said, OK, so you're having a tough time obeying your mom because she's a girl. He said, yeah, or nodded or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, son, what I wanted to tell you, what I wanted to explain to you is that's too bad. (laughs) 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 Um, And whenever your mom tells you to do something, what I want you to do is I want you to see my looming shadow right (laughs) behind your mom. (laughs) Okay. I want you to treat her as someone who's speaking on my behalf. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. And I, so I want I want you to understand that uh, Nancy and I are not adversaries. We're not two people doing two different things to the same kids. We are a team and we're working together as a team. And when your mom tells you to do something, I want you to have I want you to have a full understanding of how I've deputized her. I want you to see me standing right behind her. Mm-hmm. OK, Um and that 
is boys uh, boys obeying their father is not uh, doesn't do anything to their honor. Okay, if you're if you're uh, and I mean honor among boys, and we're not trying to flip a switch and make the world a perfect place and make all the boys never say anything out of line because your your sons are going to be uh, dealing with people the way they are, not the way everybody should be. Right? right. So if, if your sons are out with the, um, the kids down at the park, down with the boys at the park playing something. Um, and your son has to say, my dad won't let me, he can walk away from that situation with full honor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. If he mm-hmm. says, my mom won't let me, uh, he doesn't <laughs> come away with all his honor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. He, he becomes the butt of the joke. Right. And so what you want, what you want to do is whether or not mom is the one who told you, you can't, you want everybody to understand that mom is speaking with the full authority of dad. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now you can, you can, uh, play the feminist card and say, well, I think that he should obey simply because his mother required it and not bring dad into it at all. Sorry, the world's not like that. You don't get to bring up children in a perfect world. It's not, it doesn't work that way. What you want to do is take the man's strengths and utilize them in a way that helps mom and take mom's strengths and utilize them in a way that helps dad. And that all of it blesses the children. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, one time, uh, this was before that talk that I had with Nate, but one time, and this was right when he was transitioning out of uh, needing to take a nap every day. So Nancy put him down for his nap, and he got up, and she spanked him, and she put him back to bed, and he got up, and she spanked him. And Nancy knows how to spank. You know, she's it wasn't a... <laughs> But Nate had decided, well, now's the time to make the power move, right? <laughs> and so she did this like five times and spanked him. And he got up the fifth time. And so Nancy called me at work and said, so what do you want me to do? I'm in the showdown with, uh, I'm in, sh- in the showdown with Nate. What do you want me to do? And uh, I said, well, I'll be right home. Okay. So it's a small town. So I was able to drive home. And when I drove into the driveway, I saw Nate was out in the living room thinking he'd won. He saw me driving up. I saw his little head <laughs> <laughs> bound off the couch and hightail it for the um, uh, for the back bedroom. And he got the spanking of his life, probably um, the biggest spanking of his life. But the issue was dad spanking. Dad was reinforcing his he's with mom. Mm-hmm. Mom and dad are a team. Right. And so to disobey mom is to disobey dad. And, and you really want to train your sons to think in those terms. Mm. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Well, uh, Doug, this, this phrase being brandished around now, toxic masculinity, I mean, you've kind of blown it up a little bit here, but uh, yeah. uh, this idea that telling our sons to be strong or to man up, control your emotions, that somehow, harming them. How does this impact how men raise their sons today in this kind of environment, or, or should we even let this impact us at all? Uh, yeah. So here, here, this is the thing. Um, fundamentally, when you, when you're dealing with a little toddler boy, little tank of a boy, okay. Um, <laughs> he's got certain, we'll just, let's just call them passions. <laughs> right. Um, and those passions might be a passion for competitiveness when a ball is involved, it might be passion when he's hungry or thirsty or sleepy, you know, just his bodily um, desires, or perhaps when he's, if he's hurt Mm -hmm. and, um, and his emotional state. Okay. Now he's two years old. He's a little kid and his emotions such as they are, are adjusted for size. Right. And you want to teach you want to teach him to mass, to blow it out when he gets hurt, uh, to control himself when he wants to lose his temper in a, in a, a close competition, 
that that sort of thing, because what's what's going to happen is he's got these passions that are all, you know, half pint passions, but they're big for him. Mm-hmm. And you want to be teaching him self-control, self-mastery at this level, at this kindergarten level, because if you don't, if he just gives way to every passion and pitches a fit and is terrible to play games with and whines and mopes and wails when he gets hurt. If he's that kind of kid, then just wait 10 years and his body floods with testosterone Mm -hmm. and all the passions that he had before are nothing compared to sexual desire. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. They're just, um, now if you've got a kid who's got, absolutely no self-control with all the little league passions and all the college ball passions and all the minor league passions. What's going to happen when he's 13 years old, uh, full of hormones with feet, you know, his hormones with feet and he's got this gargantuan passion. How's he going to handle that? Well, I'll tell you how he's going to handle it. If he's not going to handle it and about 10 years later, we're going to have another Me Too moment because men can't control themselves. Um, so this the, the idea of um, if you want to if, – if basically, if you look at all the men who wind up in prison and you look at all the men who uh, – or young males who sh- you know, shoot up a school or do any of the toxic masculinity things, you know, um, ask yourself – how many of these young men grew up in a home without a dad? Mm-hmm. In other words, we're not talking about an excessive amount of masculinity. Right. We're talking about a deficit. We're talking about a deficit. Mm-hmm. The, these kids are hurting because they didn't have a masculine presence in their lives. The, that masculine presence has to tell them, "Look, son, you can't respond that way. Suck it up." Right. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I, yeah. That was, I think that was episode two or something. I think I, I told a story about talking to actually a grown man uh, at a, a church I attended and, and just uh, him saying he didn't want to, didn't want to be the bad guy and discipline his kids when he got home. And, and the phrase that came out of it that we've used ever since is I said, well, suck it up, buttercup. It's your job. <laughs> <laughs> so all right. just to Amen. sum all this up, uh, everything we've kind of been talking about here, what is the end goal? What would you say in summary is the end goal in raising sons and, and how can fathers kind of keep their eye on that prize? Okay. The end, I could give you the, you know, the God, Jesus Bible answer. I could also give you the <laughs> Westminster confession uh, answer, which I think are true answers mm-hmm. uh, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So that's the backdrop of what I'm about to say. But when it says blessed are the man, blessed is the man who has his quiver full of children, that passage in in uh, in the Psalms is not about the patter of little feet around the house. Okay, mm-hmm. it's it, oh, as fun as that is, <laughs> um, it says that man is bl- is blessed when he when he contends with his enemies in the gate. He's at a con- his dad is at a confrontation at the city council meeting in the city gates, and his sons are standing behind him on his side. Mm -hmm. Okay. The arrows are weapons. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what you want to do is when you have your quiver full, it's not talking about your three-year-old boy in footer jammies. That's fine. He's got to go through that, but we're talking about Mm -hmm. when, when he is, uh, when he's got your back in a confrontation and He's on your side, and he's equipped to be a help on your side. That's that's the end game. The end game is, and of course, the macro end game is to glorify God and to love Jesus and all of that. But the practical end game is to have a, a tight cohesion in your family, such that you you've got an intense loyalty that's that is not idolatrous. Okay, some some people, our, our family. Um, I've joked before that the levels of family loyalty in our family are, you know, somewhere around the Sicilian mafia level. (laughs) Um, 
only a Sicilian mafia, only without idolatry. Right? <laughs> that's that's what you want. If we know where to find you, but if we've got people listening and uh, maybe they want to read some of your books or they want to read some of your blog or they want to listen to your podcast or maybe they want to ask you maybe a they question. got a couch to burn yeah maybe they got a couch to burn or <laughs> yeah, or yeah. the new one is a field to light on fire <laughs> um if 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 you know this month you know they start reading some stuff and they're like man this guy likes lighting fires and they want to they want to contact you hopefully for good reasons uh how, how could they do that or where could they do that Okay, so um, if they want to find out what's going on, uh, Doug Wills at, uh, at com is my website. And if they want to check out uh, the books I've written, there's a header at the top of that blog that has reads books, and it just takes you to, you know, a list of books. Like it's real easy to search, real easy to uh, check out, and that's probably the best um, the best way to um, get current on what's going on here. Well, Doug, thank you for coming on, and uh, I know you are no stranger to controversy coming on the uh, patriarchy uh, during uh, No Quarter November, <laughs> to say the least. Well, <laughs> but uh, happy, thank, to, happy to do it. Yeah, thank you for coming on. We, we appreciate your time. Yeah. God bless. That was Pastor Doug Wilson, and you are listening to The Patriarchy on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. We'll be right back. Either there's going to be a great reformation and revival, right. or there's going to be civil war. Glad to have Dr. Ben Merkel here with us this evening. Welcome. I don't want my kids to be going out into the world begging please for a job. I want my kids to be the ones giving jobs to giving others. Jobs, employing people. I want yeah. to raise and graduate kings, not peons. What people ought to see when they look at a Christian household is the end of the world. The communists had an eschatology. The yeah. Muslims have an eschatology. And the Marxist eschatology, at the end of it, is the Marxism, Marxism wins. Yes. Right? Muslim eschatology, at the end of it, Islam wins. And the popular evangelical eschatology is they win. I see these guys on Facebook all the time post things like, I just can't believe how lucky I am to have married, you know, so-and-so. I don't deserve this woman. I mean, if you keep saying that you don't deserve her, you don't might. be surprised if she, she actually comes to believe that herself. Are you taking responsibility for yourself? And then having done so, are you taking responsibility for those who are under your immediate care? Be a man there right. and then trust the rest of God. Man Rampant with Douglas Wilson and special guests from Canon Press now available on Amazon Prime. Chauvinists and sexists and misogynists and 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 chauvinists and Our theme song. <laughs> Man, that was a great interview. Yes, um, it was. Yeah, I enjoyed that um, very much. Very encouraged. Very encouraged uh, with my sons. And uh, the great call to faith. And... Um, one of the things that uh, that came to mind is really that verse that you shared at the beginning of the episode, which is a righteous man who walks in his integrity. How blessed are his sons after him. Here's one of those promises. And notice that this promise here that we receive by faith, it's a promise about a righteous man who walks in his integrity. And obviously we're righteous by, uh, by Christ, his righteousness, but also as Christians, we're called to, 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 be righteous, to be holy, and to be a man of integrity. And if we are going to uh, raise godly sons and have sons that are an honor to us and are blessed, 
uh, we've got to set the example of godly men in the homes, leading, fighting, protecting. Um, Cotton Mather is one of the uh, uh, one of the like the New England Puritans wrote this book called The Well-Ordered Family or The Well-Ordered Home. And uh, one of the things he said was, parents be exemplary. Your example may do much toward the salvation of your children. Your works will more work upon your children than your words. Your patterns will do more than your precepts, your copies than your counsels. Um, he's obviously not uh, saying don't teach and preach because he spent a whole lot of time <laughs> saying that if you don't teach and preach your, to your children, you are uh, you're you're worse than an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And uh, but what he is saying is that uh, um, you need to set the example. And the second thing uh, that he says, and one of the next big things he talks about is prayer. And as we've talked about raising sons, um, especially with wives that you can get exasperated with them, or even fathers can get exasperated. And, and you're like, there's this craziness and you're trying to uh, mold it and shape it and push it towards the kingdom. And uh, one of the last things that we often think to do should be the first and, and middle and last thing to do, which is to pray pray. Uh, Cotton Mather says, address heaven with daily prayers that God would make your children the temples of his spirit, the vessels of his glory and the care of his holy angels. And, and he says, wrestle with the Lord, receive no denial, earnestly protest, Lord, I will not let thee go except thou bless this poor child of mine and make it your own. Um, Faith wrestles mm -hmm. with the Lord and, and won't let him go, saying, I, I'm praying for my son. Um, Cotton Mather says, join fasting to your prayer. And, and finally, he, this instruction from him is, man, your family is a pagan family, he says, if it is a prayerless family. You're a pagan father if you're not praying for your children. Hmm. That's good. Well, put your faith in Christ's work. Be a man of integrity. Set an example in your home and in your marriage. Pray, and by faith, raise your sons so that when they become men, they will stand beside you in the faith, and that when you're old, they will lay you to rest. At that point, having taken up the cause of the kingdom for themselves and for their families, that they would raise their sons to do the same. To the glory of God. And that is our episode for this week. If you have been blessed by this episode, if you want to support us and support the network, go to fightlaughfeast.com, click to sign up to become a member, and use the code PATRIARCHY when you do to help support our show in particular. It also gets you access to behind-the-scenes content, extra material, and some goodies in the mail. You will not regret it. And we thank you very much to those of you that already are members. I do see those coming in, and we appreciate you very, very much. It helps support us and helps us continue making this kind of content for you in the years to come. So until next time, if you have not yet bowed your knee to Christ, repent and believe. And if you have, this is our call to you. Build, fight, protect, lead. This is the patriarchy.